Good afternoon and welcome to the first Institute of Business Ethics webinar of 2021. And I'm delighted that for our first event this year, we are welcoming in from California, a, a very good friend and colleague of mine from many, many years back, uh, Professor Kirk Hansen, who is going to be talking about his latest book, uh, Rotten, Why Corporate Misconduct Continues, and what to do about it, which he has uh, co-authored uh, with another distinguished business school professor, uh, Mark um, Epstein. And uh, before I introduce Kirk, I should just give a few housekeeping uh, remarks. So first of all, if you have any technical questions, um, there is a raise your hand box. So please uh, type in any questions there. If you would like to ask a question of, of uh, Kirk uh, or Laurie, who I will introduce uh, in a few minutes, then uh, please do put those questions in the question box. We are recording uh, this session and it will be available to everyone who has registered uh, within the next uh, 24, 48 hours. And it will also be going on the Institute website. And we will be live tweeting during the course of the webinar. So this is not a Chatham House rule event as we sometimes do. Um, do feel free to quote and uh, when you do tweet, if you are a Twitterer, uh, then please uh, use the hashtag uh, business ethics and it's at IBE UK. Uh, and if you uh, check, then you will also find uh, Kirk's um, Twitter uh, handle as well, and Laurie's and indeed my own too. So without um, more ado, I would love to uh, hand over um, to uh, to Kirk. As I said, when Kirk has, has finished, um, we're going to invite Laurie, one of my fellow IBE trustees, uh, to give a short uh, response and uh, some further thoughts, but I'll introduce Laurie properly in a few moments. So Kirk, with that, over to you. Thank you very much, David. I, I am uh, delighted to be invited to participate in an IBE uh, webinar. And uh, this is an opportunity to continue a dialogue that David Grayson and I have had for some 30 to 40 years now since we first met. Uh, both of us deeply concerned about how corporations behave and what they contribute to society. Um, my co-author in the book Rotten, Mark Epstein. The two of us have taught uh, collectively at Harvard and Stanford and INSEAD, and most recently I was a professor at Santa Clara University, and I've stepped down from that recently. Um, our observation is that there have been a lot of books, some quite good, about how to manage an organization ethically and responsibly. And yet, irresponsible action continues. Corporate misconduct continues. And so Mark and I both stepping down at the point of uh, some, some form of retirement, although we both continue to write most of the time, um, wanted to reflect on why it was that our own efforts, consulting with 100 to 150 companies and teaching uh, a couple of generations of MBA students, why those haven't had the kind of impact that we had wanted. And so this book is our attempt to explore that. The core insight that I think we have is that none of us, corporate executives, academics, have thought about the causes of misconduct sufficiently before we begin to design solutions for how to make the company more ethical or more responsible. And that it's really important to focus on the sources of misconduct. And so the book addresses that first. It says, why does misconduct occur? And I'm gonna show you a couple of slides, not many, just three or four, uh, to illustrate the key points in the book. And so if you'll bear with me, I will attempt to share my screen. And if someone could tell me whether that's uh, indeed sharing the screen. Yes, we can see the slides, Prof Hansen. Very good. 
Okay, so um, the key element uh, here, and I can't see the slides, so let me just advance one which should give you bad apple, bad barrel, and bad orchard. Um, the insight here is that we've been limited in our analysis of why misconduct occurs and why even the best of our companies have been caught in scandal after scandal. And so we tried to take the problem apart. And in our sense, there are uh, several reasons. Uh, each of them is a hypothesis about why misconduct occurs. They all are, contribute something to the analysis. Bad apples is obviously uh, the first of those, that there are simply a certain percentage of people who are unethical or who are so weak morally that they take advantage of any opportunity they can to pursue their self-interest over the corporate interest or the public interest. And I guess our uh, could I just encourage you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Certainly. could I just encourage you need to switch on to one more slide because we've still got the the initial slide at the moment. All right, let me uh, see if I can manage to do that here. Um, and I'm not sure how I get back to that. All right. I think I'm going to proceed, and uh, the slides are going to be made available to you. Um, Indeed. And uh, uh, there are there are just two or three of them uh, that uh, are relevant to what I'm going to be talking about. Um, bad apples, bad barrels, and bad orchards. And the element that we think has been neglected is particularly bad orchards. But we have done a poor job of the first two, of dealing with bad apples and bad barrels. The bad apples, uh, we've come to conclude that there are a certain percentage of people in any organization who are ethically weak. Either they are outright malevolent, seeking self-interest against anything else, uh, or they are um, uh, weak in their uh, ethical strength and therefore uh, will be very quick to uh, uh, succumb to temptation, uh, to uh, uh, expediency when they're trying to achieve the goals uh, within the company. Um, David, are we now seeing me? Are we okay on that? Yes, we are. We're fine. Thank you very Great. much. And as you say, the slides um, will be available afterwards um, for anyone who wants yes. to, to consult them. And, and, and so the first, the first part of the book, and really, the core of what we've come to believe is that we failed to identify and understand as thoroughly as we need to why there's misconduct in organizations. And so the bad apples, of course, can be executives as well as uh, hourly employees down in the organization. There are a variety of ways of dealing with bad apples. Our sense is that companies have generally not been good at identifying bad apples quickly and dealing with them, uh, restricting their ability to engage in misconduct or terminating them uh, from the organization. Uh, and certainly in the case of CEOs that misbehave, boards have been poor in reining in the kind of negative behavior. Uh, we just had recently the case of McDonald's where there was a, a kind of a, a frat boy culture uh, brought in by a CEO that came in uh, two or three years ago, and the board was very slow to deal with that and finally to fire the individual last year. Uh, unfortunately, bad apples exist everywhere, and it is a fundamental task of organizations to deal with them. And so we provide uh, in the book a number of analyses of how we've tried to deal with bad apples and what new ways we need to try. The second is bad cultures, bad barrels. And indeed, much of corporate work in ethics is, is dealing with corporate culture. Uh, our sense is that corporate efforts to reform the culture have generally been uh, unsuccessful, um, that the typical corporation has not succeeded in creating a culture where people really believe 
that the company and the executives want them to behave ethically. This results from a variety of things. We focus in the recommendations. We have 10 core recommendations. We focus on purpose, which has been more debated within the European context than in the American context. But corporate purpose is one of the steps that we think can make a breakthrough. Typically, at least in our experience, even with European companies, British and others, ethics is considered not to be an asset, uh, but to be a constraint. And therefore we have a constraining set of rules in the code of conduct, which prevents people from behaving in certain ways. And that that's the way we think about ethics. It's compliance, not ethics. It's constraints, not enablers. That has to be turned over on its head if we're to have any opportunity to fight the pressure of quarterly earnings, to fight the temptations of padding the pockets of the senior executives. And therefore we make a number of recommendations about how to recast corporate purpose to address that question. There are a variety of other things in the subject of how to create an ethical corporate culture. We focus on a number of them, uh, what true leadership uh, looks like uh, uh, on the part of the CEO, but we make a great emphasis on the role of the middle managers who are the translators of that balance between uh, a fiduciary or a financial performance goal and a social performance goal or social purpose. And the middle managers, at least in our experience, are not well addressed. They are not given the responsibility <clears throat> for communicating that purpose throughout the organization and embodying it in the policies of each of their units. A scandal like the Wells Fargo one in uh, the last few years, uh, where the sales organization completely uh, neglected any kind of concern for the customer and were creating fake accounts and so on, was indicative of the fact that those senior, senior managers and middle managers only focused on their performance goals. And they were told that the growth of the number of, of uh, cross-sold accounts was absolutely central to the financial performance of the firm. And so that was all they paid attention to. Instead, the middle management has got to be brought into the task of balancing the social purpose and the financial purpose of the organization. And we finally make a set of recommendations around the reform of the actual corporate ethics programs, training programs, uh, code of conduct programs, and so on. The last piece of this that's really critical is the concern for how you think about the vulnerability of the company to ethical problems. It's not just how many bad apples do you have what's the state of your culture? It's also, do you operate in difficult environments? And so we've added in our analysis, this concept of bad barrels or bad orchards. And a bad orchard is a competitive environment where it is difficult to hold to ethical norms. Um, I've advised a number of companies moving into China. What are the special ethical challenges of operating in China? Or what are the special ethical challenges of operating in certain industry sectors. The fact that the aircraft industry has had a set of cases of bribery involving virtually all major aircraft manufacturers is indicative of that being a difficult competitive environment. And only when you understand what difficult competitive environments your firm operates in, will you begin to be able to prepare to deal with those effectively. So the bad barrel is a critical concept. The choices, of course, are you may not enter that market at all, uh, avoidance. <clears throat> Another is that you operate in that environment and try to be so well managed that you can resist the pressures. Uh, you train your people so well that they will not be drawn in to the corruption that may be common in that environment. 
but there may be collective engagement strategies and the efforts through Transparency International, for example, to try to get a business coalition together to make headway against corruption uh, is a part of that engagement strategy, which a number of companies are using in some uh, of those bad orchards that they operate in. Our argument is that only by understanding the risks of bad apples and bad barrels, the culture, and bad orchards, can a company begin to think about how to manage its ethical behavior. And so for the culture, as I say, we have the 10 recommendations. For the broader problem of how do we prepare ourselves to address this environment, to address the task of managing ethically, we present in the book a set of three tools that we think will help with that. The first is to understand what are the most serious kinds of uh, incidents of corporate misconduct. And um, there, there are really two things that enter into that calculation, because if I don't know how bad incidents in the past of my company are, I won't really understand how serious a problem I have. And it's both a measure of the damage done and it's a measure of the intent. So let me give you two cases to think about. General Motors in the United States had uh, a scandal involving the uh, uh, ignition, uh, involuntary ignition problems that were based upon the fact that a middle manager, in order to save cost, had decided not to create a new part number for what was indeed a new part. He made it, gave it the number of an old part so that it didn't have to be retested. This has echoes of Boeing and uh, the, the 737 MAX. Uh, and when this middle manager at General Motors did that, it resulted in a ethics risk, a safety risk, which ended up killing more than 125 people through the problem created by that mismatched part. That was serious. That was clearly a very serious incident of misconduct. The intent is the second factor to think about. Was there intent? Well, certainly there was on the part of the individual, but was this something the company was sponsoring? Was this something that had the support of the senior management, the most senior management? Certainly not, but it was an individual in the middle who was making a decision to try to save money because there was pressure to try to save money that was coming from the top. So we, we evaluate that as not serious corporate senior management intent, uh, and it is still a very serious incident of misconduct. We have a scale from one to 10, uh, basically five points on damage and five points on intent. And my uh, daughter-in-law, who's an American political scientist, suggested the, the name Syndex for this measure this tool of evaluation. And so the book presents how to do a syndex calculation. Uh, the, um, the case of BP and uh, the explosion in the Gulf of Mexico obviously ended in a series of deaths, 11 deaths on the platform itself, uh, quite a bit of uh, environmental damage uh, to the Gulf of Mexico shores, uh, one of the most serious environmental disasters in history. In that case, you've got, again, uh, a, a serious question of damage. No question it ranks, if you're measuring zero to five, it probably ranks a five. Uh, but on the other hand, the intent, it wasn't that senior management wanted somebody to blow up a uh, platform in the Gulf of Mexico. It was that there was huge pressure on earnings. And in our reading, uh, to the extent that middle managers came to understand they should try to cut corners on certain kinds of products and procedures and parts that led to uh, having an ethics risk, a risk of blowout that would not have been there otherwise. And so there was some shared intent on the part of senior management. 
that again, we probably ranked at a total of nine out of 10. There are others that uh, uh, clearly are indeed individuals at the very bottom of the organization. Barings Bank and the rogue trader uh, in Asia uh, was probably in no way uh, tolerated by senior management and, and embarrassed them hugely and led to the collapse finally of Barings. And, and so that would be ranked as a uh, less serious uh, incident of misconduct, but of course the effect on the company was devastating. The, uh, so that's our first measure. And the reason you need to understand this tool, the syndex, is that you wanna be able to evaluate the seriousness of incidents in the past, give some lessons for the company, and you want to think about the risk of having that kind of incident in the future. And so it becomes a part of ethics risk analysis. The other two tools we present and provide some detail on how to do them is ethical performance audits, backward looking, how have we done in the past? What do those patterns indicate about weaknesses in how we handle bad apples, and bad barrels, and bad orchards. And then a second, uh, a third tool, an ethics risk audit, which evaluates the risks that we are currently running by our policies towards bad apples, by our policies towards the creation of an ethical culture, and our concern for bad orchards and how we mitigate the risk of dealing in those. Our sense is that uh, only if we make use of those tools will we be able to manage better within the organization. But those tools and this kind of analysis becomes important also for investors. And so we have a, a chapter, a final chapter that looks at the stake investors have in understanding the susceptibility companies have to further incidents of misconduct in the future. And we, we think if um, investors will use those tools uh, that we suggested for the company's use internally, they can make great headway in understanding where to discount certain investments uh, because of the risk that they run. It's, the same, it's a similar analysis to what's being increasingly done in sustainability, uh, in environmental exposure to climate change. This is a dimension of corporate performance and corporate risk that investors have been very poor at understanding and getting a handle around. If indeed this continuing litany of corporate misconduct indicates a um, the potential that a company could suffer a substantial financial loss, then it's important for the investors to understand that. It's also an important lesson, frankly, uh, and uh, information for people who want to go to work for a company. With the increasing uh, questioning by millennials and younger uh, employees about the nature of the company I'm joining, about its values, its purpose, its tendency its potential to engage me in a risk, in an ethics risk. Um, a number of Republican legislators in the United States wish they had done better ethical risk analysis because of their backing of President Trump. Um, there, unless an individual who's joining an, a corporation knows something about the ethics profile and the ethics risk that that company runs, they can't make a good judgment about what company to go to work for. That's the basic analysis in the book. I'll make one more comment, which is about the role of business school faculty. Mo both Mark and I have dedicated our lives to teaching in graduate business schools and in executive programs. To too great an extent, I think we have, uh, first of all, not understood these three causes of misconduct, but we've also relied on the hope that by teaching ethics, we will change the values of the senior managers that we're training. 
and the future senior managers in the MBA programs we've been involved with. I think, unfortunately, uh, that's been a faint hope. I think instead we need to do the kind of teaching that focuses on the real causes of ethical misconduct and how those risks can be mitigated. Even if our students are not oriented towards purpose and virtue, they can understand the risk that the organization runs by its behavior and the potential damage to the future of the organization by repeated misconduct. And so uh, I, as we've gone on the last couple of years particularly, we've taught differently than we did in the past. And so when we wrote this book, we thought about it as a potential reading in uh, MBA ethics programs and executive programs to present in uh, not a lot of pages. It's a it's relatively short book, 160, 170 pages, that it can brief uh, executives and MBA students on the causes of misconduct. Some of the strategies that have been taken to try to mitigate those risks and basically have not yet succeeded or perhaps have failed badly. Um, and uh, that would help uh, them think about how to manage ethics risk in the organizations that they're a part of. I'll come back finally in the end to just make one more pitch for corporate purpose. Um, our sense is that the only hope we have of balancing, if you like, virtue and uh, self-interest, uh, financial self-interest, is if our organizations embrace uh, whole, wholeheartedly a concurrent purpose that is social, uh, that serves society, can we balance it against the tremendous appeal of financial models, of self-interest in, in building personal wealth, uh, and that our corporate leaders are the keys to doing that? And so that's uh, that's what we hope from this book. Uh, Mark and I are going to continue to write. We're doing blogs. We're doing uh, a variety of other things, a set of videos. Um, and we hope to be in dialogue with any of you on this call. Uh, and through the notes afterwards, you can find how to contact us <clears throat> through Lanark Press uh, or directly. Uh, I still use my Santa Clara University uh, email. So thank you for listening to my summary here, and I'm eager to engage in discussion about any of these points. Kurt, David. thank you enormously for kicking us off on this first IB webinar of 2021. So many important points there that absolutely resonate with our major institute themes for 2021 in terms of how do we really create and sustain an ethical culture, how do we manage people ethically? So really helpful tips there and, and insights for us. I promise you, I have already rewritten my Cranfield lectures for March to include some of the, the analysis of rotten in terms of the bad apples and the bad barrels and the bad orchards and so on. And I love the syndex and the other tools. But let me hand over now to one of the trustees of the Institute of Business Ethics, Laurie. Uh, Laurie is, amongst many other roles, uh, the, the chair of the Ethics Board of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland. Uh, she is part of the Bank of England's Purposeful uh, Company Task Force. We're particularly looking at uh, investor stewardship. So all of those points you were just making right at the end, Kirk, about the crucial importance of using these tools also to improve the skills and the capacity of investors, especially ESG investors, to get the, the governance and the social aspects as well as the environmental aspects right of their investments. I'm sure I'm giving music to Laurie's uh, ears too. And in her day job, she is the Director of Regulatory and Public Policy for EY UK. So Laurie, some immediate reactions, please. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, David. And Prof Hansen, in my syllabus at my MBA, we did cover um, a little bit of ethics, but um, I do have to uh, remark that I do think there's much more, more to be done in that regard. 
Um, thank you very much for the introduction. What I'd like to do is just pick up on a couple of elements, particularly on the backdrop of the global pandemic. Um, I'd like to reflect a little bit on your uh, analogy around bad barrel relating to the corporate culture, because if there was ever a question about the materiality of leadership conduct at the beginning of last year pre-pandemic, -pan, pre then companies recently profiled in the press, certainly in the domestic market, would testify that the importance the importance that a wider set of stakeholders have on issues, whether that be environmental, social, or governance, or professional conduct, if there was ever a time to drive change, it's now. So for me, under the ESG topics and issues, systemic issues of our time, professional conduct does indeed have an, a material impact on both an individual's reputation, but equally the financial performance of an organization. So for me, all of this, your theory, your examples, the um, corporate cited, for me, this comes back to trust in business and something that you spoke around about accountability. So I think an element of accountability does span across a broader set of stakeholders and a broader set of actors, more than just the individuals. And so to pick up on your investor point, I believe that the investors play a vital role in accountability across that ecosystem, but also against individual professional conduct. So rules are not enough. I agree wholeheartedly with your um, with your assertions around investor engagement. And the investors do have levers to pull. So in, in some of the examples you cited, investors can hold corporates and individuals to account by voting against reappointments. They can hold accountability by publicly disclosing naming and shaming those individuals who get it wrong or companies that get it wrong, but equally naming and faming best practices. Investors certainly in the domestic market have engaged much more collectively and raised issues with individual organizations on ESG matters. And if there was, if there was, uh, if there was one, one, reflection that I would have, and I actually read it in a paper yesterday morning, that typically experience tells us history um, would, would validate that when there's an ESG issue, an environmental issue like you spoke about, or perhaps a social issue that you spoke about, typically there is a governance issue and a conduct issue. So for me, I think that the investors absolutely have a, a vital role to play domestically as well as globally to recalibrate expectations of a wider set of stakeholders. And I say it again, particularly on the backdrop of the pandemic and as we move into the, the rest of the year and perhaps um, a recession upon us. I do think that the investors play, play a really important role. So with that, I might pause um, and see if there's any, any questions, David, that um, might have come through and or Prof Henson to invite any reflections on my assertions relating to ESG and investor accountability, particularly in the corporate setting. Thank you so much. Um, we are already getting in a number of questions, so please do keep the questions coming in. And thanks also to a number of individuals who sent in questions in advance. So I'm going to try and, and do a bit of a juggling act in including some of the excellent questions from before the webinar, as well as some of the ones coming in now live. So let's see if we can have a fast and furious um, set of uh, Q and A's. Um, so Interesting question from Tina Russell about whether it's in a sense easier for an organization if it's confronted with a really big ethical challenge, with a really big instance of corporate misconduct, 
because it hits the media. It's um, not something that can be swept under the carpet very easily. Whereas Tina asks, isn't the bigger problem actually the lower key, much greater volume range of instances of corporate misconduct, which don't escalate to become a social media sensation, which don't get um, massive uh, attention by distinguished business school professors like Kirk and, and, and Mark, etc. Any thoughts on that, Kirk? Is, 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 is the focus well, too much on the big scandals? Well, certainly for a book like we've written, we wanted to illustrate it with cases that uh, people would understand and have heard of. And so we picked 17 cases that we profile in the book and try to characterize them as reflecting bad apples, bad barrels, bad orchards, or particular kinds of poor practices. But I agree with Tina very much. The, the damage done to the company, to its interests, uh, is certainly great across all aspects of misconduct. Um, and individual uh, behavior can do damage to uh, the reputation of a company on the day to day. It can anger a customer or it can anger an investor. Um, there's an incident reported last week here in the United States where a UPS delivery person just before Christmas uh, was about to deliver a package to the front door of this house, saw that it was a Hispanic name and being a racist, this individual apparently ranted uh, and said, I don't want to deliver to, you know, so on and so on, uh, marked it uh, failed delivery so that it went back into the system and the person didn't get the package for another week or two. The problem in this case was that there was a ring uh, camera uh, on the front door. It was all recorded and of course became huge embarrassment for UPS, uh, damaged its relationships with Hispanic Americans and so on. Those kinds of interactions don't have to come to broad public attention, just the damage done to the relationship with an individual customer. The problem, and, and let me use this as a chance to respond a bit to uh, Laurie's uh, points. I, I think there is a reductionism which occurs in how corporations manage ethics. They reduce ethics to compliance or they reduce ethics to ESG, and I'll say it in this way, as specific actions on environmental sustainability or specific contributions to social benefit or particular characteristics that one can check off of governance uh, uh, quality. Yes, those are all good things, but they don't capture all of the detail things I think Tina's referring to of the day-to-day -day kind of activity. The other response I have to Lori is that uh, at least in the United States, we have not had uh, as much of a willingness to engage stakeholders. And despite, uh, I, I, I was a skeptic a year ago when the Business Roundtable issued its statement um, lauding attention to all the corporate stakeholders. Because I was a consultant in 1979 when the Business Roundtable wrote two statements ago on ethics. And we had exactly the same words about multiple stakeholders in the 1981, it was finally published, statement. And the round table over time, well, first of all, that was never implemented. There were never any measures to what that meant. And then in 1999, the business round table issued another statement, which was much more favorable to shareholders alone. And so now in 2019, they have gone back to multiple stakeholders. Never has it been operationalized, and therefore I've, I'm a skeptic about the impact that is going to have. I think companies will be more influenced by understanding the risks that they run in the bad apple analysis or the risks of a bad culture or the risks of operating in bad orchards. Um, but I, I, um, uh, I, I worry when it when this ethics content, which is meant to to influence every aspect of company decision making at every level, is reduced to either compliance or to just ESG. So that's a bias of mine. I apologize for my 
having my soapbox here about that. You're, you're allowed to have, have these biases, Kirk. So a really uh, interesting question from a good friend uh, and um, uh, partner of, of, of the Institute, uh, Ruth Steinholz. Um, Ruth asks, is there a danger in trying to characterize the situation that this is bad apple or this is bad barrel? Are we in danger of oversimplifying, Ruth asks, when actually it's often the interaction between bad apple and, and bad barrel? And it's that the organization is, is being lax, for example, about the, uh, the behaviors of star salespeople, for instance. Um, so is there a danger of oversimplifying, is Ruth's question. Uh I, I think uh, your uh, your listener would have enjoyed the debates Mark Epstein and I had over, does this go in the bad apple or the bad barrel or the bad orchard category? Because many of the examples are strongly influenced by a bad individual who happens to be in a bad culture. And maybe there's a bad orchard that that bad individual is now going to be drawn into corruption or, or drawn into some kind of nefarious behavior. And so I think indeed, Every case is much more complex that it can't be explained by a single part of this analysis. But the analysis of these cases really gives good insights into where new strategies or new interventions need to be made in culture or in the ways we manage bad apples or in our choice of which orchards to function in and uh, which to avoid. Thank you. Now, now Ruth's come back um, um, with with a supplementary, which I'll I'll allow on this occasion. So I think it's it's, it's highly relevant. Um, um, she's saying that it's is it that the person really was a bad apple when they joined the company in some cases? I think in 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 your initial presentation you did say that that actually the the, the solution there was for companies to get much better at identifying bad apples preferably before they get recruited in the first place, and certainly much earlier in, 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 in their time with, with, with the organization. Let's move on to a question from um, Malcolm Slee. Um, Malcolm talks about the importance of tone from the top and mm -hmm. the kind of the example that, that leaders set and so on. But as we say in the Institute, very often the, 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 the leadership that most people in big organizations see isn't the very, very top, the board and the senior management team, it's their line managers. So it's more tone from above. And you talked in your presentation, Kirk, about the importance of getting much better at the training of, of middle managers. So yes. can we unpick that a little bit more? Because for years we've talked about the middle management black hole in a lot of these questions. I, I think the problem of the bad apple or uh, bad signals about what behaviors are desired can come from the very top or can come from the middle. In, in some cases, it's clear that the senior executive or members of the senior executive team give the message uh, in a token way, oh, be ethical, but it's meet those performance uh, uh, measures of uh, the, those KPIs uh, that will make sure we grow at a certain rate or we achieve certain kinds of, of returns. Um, and that's where ethics is an afterthought or it's a mere constraint or it's a mere matter of compliance uh, or it's a mere matter of checking the boxes. Um, for the middle manager, the challenge is greater because the middle manager is squeezed. Often the middle manager has the key performance indicators that our growth or profitability or uh, date to ship or whatever it is, and yet are pressed with the realities of how to retain the trust in Lori's terms of all of those stakeholders uh, while trying to achieve the KPIs. So we need to equip those middle managers with the skills to be able to do that. That involves some training. It, there's a lot of signaling in the training hey, we really do want you to follow these ethical norms or this corporate purpose. This isn't BS, this is, this is genuine. 
uh, but it's also equipping them to say, how do I embody that purpose or that ethical principle of customer focus in my operation? Wells Fargo announced last week, it's going to have a new emphasis on sensitivity to customers. We're gonna have a new committee within Wells Fargo to create a, a, a set of norms about how we treat the customer. This is because of repeated instances, even after the major scandal in 2015. Um, that's gotta be owned by every middle manager, not by a special committee. Um, and it can't certainly be an afterthought. So we, we do recommend, one of our key recommendations is to fix the responsibility with the middle management for translating the purpose into real goals and policies. Um, so th that becomes important. Let me say one other thing. That's not to de-emphasize the importance of the senior management setting the tone, and it's not to de-emphasize the importance of the ethics team and the ethics organization. One of our 10 recommendations uh, is that the uh, ethics officer or a senior person with the ethics responsibility have a, an opportunity to participate in what um, Alan Yospi, who some of you may know, who was Health South's, uh, uh, or rather, uh, uh, Hospital Corporation, HCA's ethics officer for so many years. Um, Alan said, I considered a great vir uh, victory when I was invited in to discuss a meta ethics issue, i.e. a big, hairy strategic problem. And the, the, the senior management really wanted an ethics perspective. That's what we've got to get for a senior ethics person is that access to the boardroom, to the room where it happens, for those of you who are Hamilton fans. That's what uh, that's one of our key recommendations. Uh, absolutely. And uh, just to say on the whole question about how we improve the quality of ethics training, particularly but not just for line managers and middle managers, we have a new IBE publication coming out very shortly on looking at some of the latest good practice amongst our supporters and, and, and others about how to deliver really effective training. I was reflecting as you were speaking, Kurt, one of our advisory council members in the Institute, Sir Mark Moody Stewart, who of course ran Shelf many years, chaired Anglo American yes. and, and has held and many I've, other I've had a chance to be, senior I've roles. I've had a chance to be on the podium with him a couple of times. And you 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 know how thoughtful that 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 that, that uh, Sir Mark is. He talked in, in his own book uh, about responsible leadership, about the importance, as he learned the hard way, of just repeating and repeating and repeating some core messages mm -hmm. about ethical behavior and what's expected of people. And that senior leadership shouldn't assume that you put out a statement from on high and everyone a even knows about that statement in the organization, let alone reads it, let alone internalizes it, let alone understands it and applies it back to their own circumstances. So Mark argues about the importance of repeating and repeating and, and, and repeating. And I think that's a, a point that, that that also then gets picked up in, in, in an excellent question from, from Stella Chandler, which I will um, come to. But I just want, want to make sure as well, Laurie, um, can you wave if you would like to um, come in at any point, please? Because I'm, I'm um, dealing with, with, with lots of different open boxes at the moment, so I can't see if, if, if there's any comments uh, in, in, in our chat room as well. So Stella um, talks about uh, the importance of senior leaders checking the information that is coming into them. And are they actually getting an accurate picture of what is happening out there on the ground? And that, I think, echoes. I'm not sure whether it was a question from Stella that came in from before the webinar or a different uh, contributors, but it was a question about the, the Sydney Yoshida's uh, concept of, of iceberg ignorance um, and about whether, in fact, some people use that idea that leaders get very remote from what is really happening on the ground, whether some people use that as a convenient uh, excuse, as a kind of way of, of, of delivering Margaret Heffernan um, um, idea of willful blindness. Um, oh. Is it a convenient way of, of, of being able to 
justify your ignorance if, if you don't keep really up to date with what's happening on the ground? There's certainly a lot of that behavior uh, amongst senior corporate executives. Um, and it's troubling because uh, sometimes it is very deliberate. It's willful blindness about what goes on in the organization. I think more commonly, it's simply because of poor systems and poor ways of bringing the information to the attention of the senior management and the board. Uh, and system solutions often can address that. Uh, we make a pitch in the book, uh, one of our 10 core recommendations about corporate culture is that every incentive, uh, every uh, compensation plan, every incentive plan be examined for its ethical implications and its ethical temptations, if you like. And too many uh, of the systems are put in place without that kind of scrutiny. The, the obvious case of Wells Fargo putting a compensation system in that rewarded one thing, opening new accounts, and then making that an hourly goal. If you didn't have a, a certain number of accounts uh, opened within that hour, then as the hour ticked down, you found any way to open them you could, even if it was falsification. So uh, I, I think, unfortunately, the attention given to this by senior executives is poor. The systems of data, and that's why we make a pitch on these three tools. We think ethical performance auditing, ethical risk audits are critically important uh, in terms of informing everybody. Uh, and certainly that is, first of all, the senior management team. Fargo example. Let's illustrates the fact that it's not just compensation of very senior executives and, and, mm -hmm. and the very top high-flying salespeople and everything, but it is actually the way in which organizations choose to remunerate the, a range of their employees as well, because in that case, mm -hmm. it was it was something that, that was very pervasive through, through the organization, wasn't it? Um, a question from Jim I mean, I've, I've said... David, if I may, I've said enough things to rile Laurie up. Would you like to weigh in at this point? Uh, Pop you. Hansen, I, I, would love, I would love your reflections on the pandemic and what impact you think that will have on conduct because um, some of the tools that you reference in your book and the practical tip for leaders, obviously being at the big four, I know better than anyone that that's a rear view mirror of you know any audit or any reporting mechanism is nearly you know 12 months ago and so i just wondered what you thought the global pandemic might do or or have what implications it would have on conduct given the you know pace of change that's happening so if we agree with this notion from Mark Carney, for example, that we're entering into the next industrial revolution, often it takes decades to achieve change. Do you think there's anything positive that will come from the current situation? Well, I think, I think you are right on target. There are some big lessons to be learned from the pandemic, and I'm not sure we know all of them as yet. I've, I've written recently in my blog and in my newsletter about employment practices and the pandemic and the range of reactions companies have had, some making every effort to keep people employed and others sloughing people and uh, laying people off very readily. Um, and even amongst the most profitable companies during this pandemic year, we saw that range of behavior. So I think there'll be a debate about that over the next few months. And I hope we learn something about the importance of keeping the loyalty of employees, of building a culture of strength that says something more than it's only about the profits. It's only about increasing my the owner's additional billions of wealth. Uh, it's about us as a community. And so I think there'll be more of a focus on community. Um, there'll be a tremendous debate about what the workplace looks like post-pandemic. Um, and uh, uh, in the United States, of course, the, um, uh, the Trump presidency is an earthquake at least as big as the pandemic and will cause a rethinking on the part of many companies about 
whom they do business with, uh, and so on. The fact that so many American companies just in the last two to three days have made decisions to cut off either support of the Trump uh, businesses or contributions to those who supported overturning the results of the election is really a significant break from past corporate practice. And so I think this year we will learn a tremendous amount because of actions that are perceived as misconduct if they're not misconduct and the debate over what is the responsibility of the company in this in these particular difficult times. I don't have uh, a quick answer to follow up on what those lessons will be. Okay, so, just to follow up on, on that question, do you think that the widespread move to working from home has had an impact, will have an impact in terms of the analysis of, 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 of Rotten? In other words, is it going to make it easier for corporate misconduct or, or the opposite, do you think? I think in some ways it's going to make it easier because obviously there isn't as much day-to-day -day monitoring by managers. We're, we're headed to a model with fewer middle managers, I think, because of uh, remote uh, work. Um, I've been reading a lot about that the last couple of weeks, uh, which will change the degree to which managers are aware of what their employees are doing. The counterforce to that is that we're going to have a whole new set of monitoring tools using AI, uh, artificial intelligence, um, and a lot more surveillance electronically of deals being made uh, by employees, uh, middle managers. And so there may be a countervailing force there that results either in greater scrutiny and therefore less room for bad apples to act, or uh, could go the other way and still have less, uh, uh, less opportunity. To monitor and, and 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 i can't help thinking given how steeped you are in 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 the heart of silicon valley we should be having you back on another occasion as part of a another webinar or round table to to talk about the ethics of a lot of mm -hmm. these new ai enhanced surveillance techniques and so on for working from home but right now i'm afraid we're going to need to 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 draw stumps on this conversation Quick last question though that we had from before the webinar about President Trump. Does his behavior encourage more people to say, well, if the president can do that kind of bad conduct, it's, it's, it's okay for me too? Do you think it encourages more bad apples or the opposite? Well, I think unfortunately we've got a real crisis of conduct in the United States, whether it's racist behavior, disrespectful behavior, distrust um, uh, in Lori's terms. Uh, and it is unclear at this point whether we come out of this with a reaffirmation of the importance of, of good behavior and trust between people, or whether we have a permanent damage to both trust and uh, norms of behavior. But there's no question that the Trump presidency has seen the erosion of key norms of honesty, uh, respect, uh, uh, racial tolerance uh, over this four years. And so from an ethicist standpoint, I've written a review a couple of the years about here's how ethics has been eroded by the Trump administration the past year. Uh, and I gave a speech last year on recovering our ethics after Trump. But I must say, I'm not fully confident that we can accomplish that. Let, 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 let's hope the United States does indeed do that. Kirk, thank you enormously for sharing some of the key insights and messages from Rotten. Um, Laurie, thank you enormously also for responding so quickly and promptly to uh, Kirk's contribution. If you have enjoyed um, this IB webinar, then our next event's coming up on the 28th of January. We have a webinar looking at how can smaller organizations still be ethical and make sure that they are good barrels uh, operating hopefully in, in in good orchards and that will be led uh, by gwen gwen donde from from our um 
IBE team, the head of research who's just launched um, an excellent ethics toolkit on uh, our website. If you've not looked at it, please take a look at that. And then the event after that will be to launch the good practice guide for um, the latest in innovations in training for ethics, which will be moderated by Dan, Dan Johnson, who is our head of engagement, and that's on the 11th of February. But for now, thank you all very much indeed, and we look forward to seeing you hopefully next time. Thank you all. Thank you, David. Thank you, Laurie. <laughs> thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you.